Zana, isn't it only fair that MPs get a say in, in uh, triggering Article 50? Because, you know, fair enough, the referendum decided that we're going to leave the EU, but it didn't decide the terms on which we leave the EU, and that's what MPs seem to want a bit of a say on. In a sense, I suppose, triggering Article 50 doesn't tell us too much about the terms of leaving the European Union, because what triggering Article 50 does is it sets in place the start <coughs> of negotiations. And, of course, uh, what you'd expect is for the British government to ask for a lot more than it's actually going to get. You'd expect for the European Commission to ask for a lot more than it's going to get. But and it, does, it does sort of help set the, the framework, though, for so, example, whether we stay in the single market or not, which is a fundamental question. And having a bit of a debate around Article 50 allows MPs to say, look, tell us roughly what you're asking for before we agree to triggering Article 50. And I, and I think I think the, the point here, though, is that is that Parliament legislated for a referendum in the first place, and, and it told the British people that whatever you decide will be implemented. And the British people said that they wanted to leave the European Union and, and had a, a reasonable expectation that that would result in the UK leaving the European Union. And, of course, the discussion was all whether Article 50 was going to be triggered in the first 48 hours after the referendum result. That was all what the discussion was. So now it seems that the goalposts have been massively moved. But what I would say on the court case here is I think whichever way that had gone, it was going to be subject to appeal. I think if it, if it had gone the other way, then the Remain side would be appealing it now. And actually there is quite an important question of law behind all of this, which does need to be settled. On and Last with Jonathan Arnott on this, but then actually, we've got to move on. But actually part of the end deal that we end up with depends on how the European Commission plays ball with what the UK asks for. And, and one of the problems is that, of course, we don't want the hardest possible Brexit, and it's not in... It's not in the UK's interest or the European Union's interest to have the hardest possible Brexit. What you want to do is make sure that you can actually uh, ensure that you have control of who comes into the country to be able to say no to people if you want to do so, but at the same time have the closest possible trading relationship. Okay. It seems as if Nigel Farage has got the closest ear to whatever plan Donald Trump does have. Do you feel comfortable with that, Jonathan Arnott? Because I think I read some quotes from you this week saying that you feel that UKIP shouldn't be too close to Donald I, Trump. I think, I think my point that I made before the American presidential election was that you had two candidates and I didn't think that UKIP should be expressing an opinion as to whether Clinton or Trump would be better in the White House. And in fact, it was the election in American presidential history with the two most unpopular candidates, one on either side, of any election in American presidential history. And so you saw sort of a lot of people voting Trump because they didn't like Clinton and a lot of people voting Clinton because they didn't like Trump very much. And, and I think, you know, frankly, from me in the UK, I didn't feel that I should be expressing an opinion telling the American people what to do. But what then happens is, after an election, at just like after a referendum, you accept the result of that election or referendum and you move on and then part of that moving on is to say Donald Trump has been democratically elected and what we need to do is stop all the ridiculous assassinate Trump hashtags going on on Twitter and journalists saying all say uh, and journalists taking part in it we need to we need to stop all the hyperbole and all of the all of the people who are who are expressing faux outrage at all of this and actually start to work work out that what the UK now needs to do is to have a very close relationship with the United States of America. Fine, but is, is sure Nigel Farage the man to have that relationship? He's not even an elected representative of the United Kingdom. What's he doing out there? Apart from being an MEP, of course, he's not an MP. What's he doing out there having negotiations with Donald Trump when he doesn't represent the UK government? Well, I think I think Nigel is somebody who, who made his opinions very, very clear during the election campaign. He's somebody who obviously has a, a big, big part to play. And he's, he's, he's currently UKIP leader, and, uh, and in that position, as, as the leader of, of a big UK political party to be having that discussion with somebody who's about to be the President of the United States of America, you'd think that can only actually be a good thing for the United Kingdom rather than a bad thing. OK, all right. Well, while we're on the topic of Nigel Farage, you'll know he's standing down as, as UKIP leader for the third time. His tenure finally ends this month. He'll be replaced by a new leader, with the favourite candidates being the former deputy chair of the party, Suzanne Evans, and the former deputy leader, Paul Nuttall. And Jonathan Arnott, you are backing Paul Nuttall. But do we even need a UKIP anymore? You have achieved your main aim of putting us on the path to Brexit. What's the point of UKIP now? Well, I think the discussion around this, uh, around this sofa today has shown that actually uh, there's a lot of work to do before Brexit is finally achieved. But I don't think that Brexit is a goal in and of itself. Brexit gives us the tools to do what we need to do with our country, but it's only very much a starting point. I think uh, within the North East we see so many people who, are, who have been let down 
uh, frankly, by the Conservatives over a number of years. But these are people who also have been traditional Labour voters who feel completely abandoned by a Labour Party that no longer really represents the working people that it once sought to represent. And I think there is a huge, huge potential uh, for, for UKIP in the North East. And I think, we, I think we'll see massive positives. Thank you.